Troublesome times are here, filling in times with fear. Freedom we all hold dear, now is that stay. Humble your heart to God, save from the chains, chains being wrong. Seek the way pilgrims try, Christians away. My Jesus is Jesus coming soon, morning or night or noon. Thanks for sharing your time with us today. We've got a guest that's been here before, but she's back with a different vision for the city of Nashville right now. We've got Sheila Calloway. Sheila, glad to have you here. Thanks for having me again, Lila. It used to be magistrate, I never could say the word, judge, <laughs> uh, at juvenile court, and you're no longer in that position, as I understand. That is correct. As of Monday, I have been relieved of my duties at juvenile court so that I could run to be the next juvenile court judge. You want to run for judge? Absolutely. Now, you said Monday, this thing may play. Uh, uh, two, three, four weeks from now. So what was the date? Do you know what the date was I, on I that? believe it's November the 18th. November Monday, the November the 18th. You officially left. I officially um, was asked to no longer do my duties as a magistrate since I was intending to run as juvenile court judge. Well, you had an impact on one person I know because one of my daughters saw it on the news. Uh, I didn't see it on the news because I was watching a Vanderbilt basketball game. I didn't watch the news. But uh, uh, she cried. She cried when she heard that you wasn't going to be there anymore because she, she's called you for counseling before. Yes. And you helped her, and she's doing good. And when you consider her life, yes. And, and her mother's doing good. You know, her mother has spent a lot of time incarcerated, and her mother's out now. And if my, what I understand, her mother is even doing good. We're proud of that family. That family, her biological father, is involved in her life now, Wonderful. and he is a career criminal, and uh, he's out doing good. Wonderful. And so, Sheila, it's all working. It's working. Love works. It does work. And you have to do it early and often. And no matter how many times someone messes up, you have to be able to hold them accountable, but also give them a chance to get better. And, you know, when I think about your daughter that, that I've had the opportunity to work with over times, and she's, she's meant a lot to me, and she's helped me to see things in a different way. I know she's helped you to see different oh, things. Oh, yeah. <laughs> totally she different. She and her boyfriend. Yeah. Who works for me. Uh, they have helped teach me cl more clearly the challenges before the urban child growing up in this country this day in this time um, it's not a real not i'm not being critical of them they're doing as good as probably they can do with the tools they brought to the table to do things with absolutely uh and, and i just love both of them to death i mean i really love and and you know she was married and her husband was the sweetest little fellow you've ever seen and he died one night and her world went upside down and, you know, on and on. But you were there for her through all that, and I just really appreciate it, and she appreciates it, and the city of Nashville is a better place because of it. Thank you. Um, you are a, you're going to run for judge. That's correct. I'm going to run so for juvenile court judge. we need, uh, you're going to run against my friend Sophia Crawford. That's correct. And I'm not going to choose public between you and Sophia. Okay. Because <laughs> I'm going to be with the one who wins this thing. Is uh, <laughs> I'm going to be working with him in juvenile court. Um, I will have Sophia on and we'll talk about what her vision is for the court and your vision for the court. Lay, it's established the background on you. Grew up in Louisville. That's correct. I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky. You know the first time I met you? It was, you don't. I don't. I think it was at the leadership. That's right. It was a Conqueror's luncheon. Conqueror's Betty luncheon. Green was judge. Yes. And I called Betty and asked her to come and speak at the, uh, at the luncheon. And she said, I'm going to send the referee, I think is what they call it, That's referee, what we were. Sheila Calloway. And I remember, I hung a, or she sent the message to me, I guess, and I, got, and I said, she's lost her mind. <laughs> I need her over here speaking. I don't need her to send somebody over here, but I didn't, I was just, you know. And so Betty told me, said, she'll do good. And I thought, yeah, right. You know, and so I go on. <laughs> you came, and I introduced you. You gave the most powerful speech. I mean, it was great. Uh, Open my eyes, open the people's eyes. You you hit the ball out of the park. And so I called Betty back and I said, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> she said, I knew she would do good. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I that's appreciate why I Betty it. for and doing that. That too. was years ago. That, that was. was years. It was uh, years Betty ago. probably don't want me to tell that because when I was talking about years, but that was, uh, Be Betty was really confident that you would get, you'd be the right person for that job that day, and she was correct on that. Uh, why did you come to Vanderbilt? First of all, why did you choose law, then why did you choose Vanderbilt? Well, um, I'll talk about how I chose law. I knew from early on that I wanted to, to be in law and be an attorney and to help people. 
Uh, I tell this story all the time about my mom who kept all my papers when I was little and whatever papers we did. But I, I wrote a paper in fourth grade really? about what I wanted to do when I grew up. And I wanted to be a lawyer and to help people. And it has stuck with me and it's what I have just made my life's mission to serve people through the law. Um, so I went to Vanderbilt. My, I have an older sister who, who's best friend went to Vanderbilt and she would come home and talk about how wonderful it was. But of course my parents didn't want me to go here, uh, maybe because of the finances, a little more expensive than yes. the local schools in Louisville. And my sister had gone to... A lot more expensive. Let me tell you. A lot more expensive. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a lot more expensive. Yeah, my granddaughter says, I want to go to Lipscomb or Vanderbilt. And I go, yeah, that's yeah, yeah, a lot more expensive. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so my sister had gone up to Northwestern. There was some kind of deal if two kids went to the same school, you get a discount on the second child. And I was like, mm, I don't want to do that. I want to go to Vanderbilt. I want to go to Vanderbilt. And so I came to Vanderbilt, fell in love with the city of Nashville, and have never looked back. And I'm so happy that I did it. Now, you just don't have a degree. You've got some title. What is your degree? Well, I first got you my... You have more education than I have, <laughs> what I'm trying to say, Sheila. I got my undergraduate degree, uh, my Bachelor's of Arts um, in Communication and my minor was political science, knowing that I wanted to go to law school. So I went to law school at Vanderbilt immediately after, so seven years at Vanderbilt in a row, and I got my Juris Doctorate, my JD, from law school. So you are, you're the same as a person who has a doctorate degree? Yes. And, but yours is in Juris, in, and that's called, because it's law? Because it's law, yeah. Everybody in Nashville understands that except me. Yeah. yeah okay, <laughs> but I'll be okay. Um, has that served you well? Are you proud of the education you've got at Vanderbilt? Oh, absolutely. See, here's, what, here's what's going to happen to a person sitting out here. When they think of Vanderbilt, they're going to think of liberal. They're going to think, uh, oh, you'll turn everybody loose. You, you don't think anybody needs to go to jail. Uh, you'll be a do-gooder. Yeah. Answer that. Um, I don't think that that's true. I don't know if that's what the perception that's is. That's my perception. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, I, I will I'm tell a you that. Fan too, I tell you what. Go ahead. You know, go doors anchored down, yeah. anchored <laughs> down, <laughs> bowl bound hey, three years. You're talking about a man changing a city. Has changed change the city. culture. Has change changed the culture. Has changed the culture. Has changed the culture. You know, we used to be one of those schools that, um, you know, we would say, it doesn't matter anyway. We're going. You're going to work for us or whatever. Yeah, because we knew we work on a win the game. Yeah, yeah. But it has turned into a total different atmosphere that we're right. very proud of. I think. But, let me say this, and we'll get back to you running for judge, but I think that shows the hunger in this country for real leaders. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you told me uh, while we were sitting here chatting before the show, you want to be a leader. What did you say? You want to be a leader for the youth? Is that what it was? How did you it's, say that? I said, I need to be oh, okay. I need a to. leader in youth and children and family issues here in Davidson County. One person I, can make a difference. One person can make a difference. And, it, and it's just like you said before, even in your, in your daughter's life, one person can make a difference. And it's not about, I definitely believe that people have to be held accountable. Whether it's a father that's in front of me who's not paying child support, or a parent, a mother who's abused or neglected their child, or if it's a child, a juvenile who's charged with a delinquent crime. I believe they have to be held accountable. When my own child does something that I tell him not to do, he's held accountable. The problem is, is there's not one easy fit for the entire system. So you can punish one person by sending them to jail, and that may make a difference to them. But that same punishment may, may not fit the next person. And so we have to have a system that is willing to think out of the box and willing to do things a little different. And it's not a black and white situation that everybody who does this has to go to jail. It's not that easy. It's not that easy. And if you, if you think out of the box and you are more creative in the ways that you hold people accountable, then you get better results. And so, you know, I'll tell you another family story. Me and my sister are totally different, totally different people. And we both got in trouble growing up. My sister, you could take away a book. You could punish her by sitting her in a room, and she would just completely fall apart, and that would be enough for her. From the hard-headed one of the family, that didn't do it. <laughs> they had to do a little more aggressive things with me in order for me to change my behaviors. And so, so you your parents beat you regularly, <laughs> is what you're saying? <laughs> I, I, I worked at my home. <laughs> <laughs> my daddy said, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not going to throw them under the bus right now. But it, they, they knew 
that each child was different and they had to do a different type of punishment. We tend to box people in and tend to do one sentence per everybody to make that fit and to make that change a system, and that doesn't. And see, that's what the public wants, I think. When I go into a place and they say they have a zero tolerance rule, that tells me that means you have leadership that doesn't have courage and willing to stand up and st take a fir firm stand on what they think needs to happen. I think zero tolerance is a result of lack of leadership. I really believe, and lack of courage. I, I do, and you know, the zero tolerance laws, it, it binds people and it doesn't give, you know, if it's in, in a school system or a court system, it doesn't give people enough credit That's right. to figure out that they can do it a different way and That's get the same results or even probably better results than what they are. Hopefully, hopefully better doing. results. And that's what a judge is about. Absolutely. A judge is about in the individual. If a judge is going to be working, you know, it's like, and this may not be a good illustration, but our educational system, and I've always been uh, said education's overrated, and, <laughs> and people chill when I say that, but I'm right when right. I say that because education works for, let's say, 30, starting at 30 percent, zero to 30 percent, that doesn't work, starting at 30% to, let's say, 65%, or maybe even 70, we'll give a little push, 70. It was between that 30 and that 70, I hope I'm communicating clear here, because you got a degree in communication. All right. um, <laughs> they, education, our education system fits those. Right, absolutely. But that child, I had one of those that was above the 70%, education failed him. Right. Because uh, he was bored in school. Right. And I've had a whole bunch of them below that 30%, and me and them get kicked out of school every time I go to a conference Absolutely. because it doesn't address where they are. Absolutely. And I will say, I've had um, you know, another thing that um, Judge Green allowed me to do when she was um, um, the judge of juvenile court was to work on the partnership councils for the Metro National Public School System. And it's basically the academy systems okay. that are in the high schools. And I will say their push, and I continue even to this day to work with the academies, and their push to change the thought process I like that. is so much better. And you can see it in the academies because you bring business partners and you bring a different type of learning to each student that's there. And the student gets to decide, hey, I would love to go into the arts or I would love to be a part of the engineering or the art, agriculture or the you know whatever it is with the academies within the school they get to get fit in where they where they fit in and then not only does it um, help them to be more engaged in the school process it helps each student have an individualized plan of what they want to do the way they go about studying I had uh, dr. register was a guest here okay. I guess it was two years ago right okay. when the uh, some long back, it was way back, it, way my memory works, he, he had been a child then <laughs> when he was here. But it was, uh, uh, he was laying out the plan, as I understood it, that if you're coming in you're studying this subject, you will stay on that subject all day. You won't be going from here to here to here to here. You'd be working on that subject, developing that subject, and then you come back and develop the next subject. And I thought that was so good. I could have gone to school right. with all my learning disabilities if I'd had that kind of environment right. and that kind of uh, plan, lesson right. plan for me to work on, I would have been successful. But I would go here for one and go over here for another one and over here for girls and over here for this. And man, I was it all just, lost. Yeah. It didn't it didn't work. It didn't connect. And so no. now now the way that they do it in the in the high schools is you're on this pathway and you have teachers that are in a group and they teach it's team teaching that they do. And so if we start off in this area, this subject today, in all the classes that you go to, it's gonna be your evolved around that subject, which if you're in the Academy of Law, you may be studying um, the difference between federal government and state government. And so three, each of your classes, even your science class, will bring up, you know, if you have a science lab and the, the crime happened in this state, but you have the lab down in this state, and you can bring in your science, your forensics, with that same lesson. And so you're learning and you're um, re-emphasizing to the students of how important each of those subjects are to what they want to do when they grow up. I believe that's called education. And okay. you're still involved with that. I am still involved. In fact, I just came from a meeting um, that the academies are um, educating people around the nation about how we do our academy system. How's so that working? 
it's, it's going well. I think there are several jurisdictions and several states that are very interested in what we're doing and trying to model their academies after what we have already established. That can help a lot of my children. It can help a lot of your children okay. and my children. Those are my children, too. So. That's right. That's right. We share a lot of the same we, children. We have, <laughs> over the past, we've shared many a lot of the same children. We don't sit here and talk about this, about your background and not get down to it. You have a vision for Nashville and juvenile court. Same question I will ask Sophia. What, what is the judge? What would be your vision? You know, my vision is, first and foremost, that um, juvenile court, as a court, uh, be decreased in size. I think, uh, and what I, what I mean when I say that is that the services that we should be offering need to be offering in the community. And so what we have to do as a juvenile court, and the reason is because I am all about prevention and early intervention. That's my message. I'm about prevention and early intervention. And so no matter what type of case that comes through juvenile court, it affects the child. Right. And if we do stuff out in the community, send cases away or send the, the families and whatever their issues is to resources such as inner city ministries right. where it can be under a different hub, then we are effectively preventing further further touches with the criminal system. If, uh, when I get my new building, as right. a matter of fact, I think I'm, I'm going to start, I think in two weeks, I'm going to start moving my office over there. Wonderful. And the campaign's going well and raising the funds for it. We just got to keep doing it. Just work, 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 work. But it's going to be there. And I think it's going to be good for the city of Nashville. Wonderful. Uh, how can, how can what you're talking about fit in to what we are building and what we're going to do? And, and that's, this is like the prom example, and, and Oasis Center does it well. Yes. And Oasis Center is too small to take in all the children and all the families that we need help with. So your center is the perfect answer, and it's especially because of the location. It's centrally it located. It, it, it is. an mm -hmm. I, I have, I have excellent opportunity. So you have a and child. And isolated. And isolated. And so, mm -hmm. you know, you got a child that comes in, got picked up because he ran away from home. You bring them to the center instead of bringing them to the juvenile detention center. Mm -hmm. So you bring them to your center. You immediately have people on staff overnight that can do some services, figure out why did this child run away? What's going on? What, what can we do to help this child and the family? You bring in right. the family. You assess the family and see what's going on. Why is this child running away? And you arrest the problem right then and right there. You get to what is the underneath lion uh, wh whatever is underneath, and then you, you fix it. The way we do it now, the current system is you get picked up on a um, runaway charge at 2 o'clock in the morning. You go to the detention facility. Depending on how soon your parents can get, get down to you, you may or may not get dressed out into the detention guard. Mm -hmm. And so already this child who may just have some minor issues is already being treated as a criminal. And once you start doing that, then you can bet, bet that there will be more delinquent behavior. They will. What my experience with my children, you say something about going to juvenile court, well, it's not that bad. I don't mind. I'll go over. Because they, they've been conditioned to think uh, not when I go to jail, not if I go to jail, but it's when I go to jail. Yeah. Because 70, I think it's 78 percent of this figure depends on, I'll get Darren on here and he'll change the figure on me every time. But... <laughs> Uh, people who are incarcerated, their children to be incarcerated, and that's what you're talking about fixing. Absolutely. You're using a phrase Darren uses a lot, Sheriff, is to arrest the problem. Absolutely. Not the per but the problem, and Absolutely. that's what we've got to do. We've got to, as a city, Absolutely. and I think, you know, in Na we ain't got 10 minutes ago, in Nashville, other cities this may not work, Sheila, but Nashville don't have to do what other cities does. Nashville is an excellent city, we can make a difference in this city, we but it's going. We got to get out of the box, and we got to work together, because you we got to have good, strong leaders like me and you. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, me, I know. <laughs> good luck in your here. Here is, uh, you know, I, I was sitting down here a while ago thinking about the court. What can the courts do? Then the family, the school, and the church. It's going to take all of that working together. All of that. All of that working, and we have to open our doors, and we have to, we have to think about. This is not, this building right here doesn't have to be the court all the time. Right. We can, if there's a, a church that's involved in a family, let's open our doors to the church. Let's take the case to the church. 
and let's work with that system instead of bringing them to the, the actual courthouse. You are a religious person. I am. A and and person. I think if we can get those families coming to, say, coming to inner city, now what some, what some your Vanderbilt crowd is going to say, oh, no, you can't involve the church people in people's lives. Brother, you better involve the church in people's lives. I, I agree. Uh, you know, bottom line is this. They tell me, I don't take federal money. I don't take, uh, I try not to take government money because they tell me, I can, and they told me this, on one of the grants we was getting, you can't have a prayer with a child if this grant mm -hmm. comes in. You can't pray with that child. Well, I can't, can't, get that I can't help this child. Right. Uh, I can't teach him about Jesus. I can't help the child. Right. You know, you go and figure it out, suit yourself. When he kills somebody, you'll be back wanting me to pray do for something him. for him. Yeah. <laughs> the, we've got to get involved in these children and teach them early in life to set boundaries. Yes. And, and get them to understand that there's a place, there's a place. The church, we're not going to run their lives. We're going to expose them to the help they need. Absolutely. If mama's boyfriend is bad to the child and the child ran away, somebody's got to have the courage to sit down with mama and it's say, a, your, boyfriend your boyfriend is causing a problem. Yes. yes. And then what I want to do is sit down with boyfriend. Yes. And say, hello. You're causing a problem. <laughs> yes. You are the problem. <laughs> Absolutely. And then he goes off into a rage and say, big boy, you, you're you talking to somebody here. And really try to win him over yes. to where he's not the problem. He can become the answer. Yes. He just needs to change the way he talks and the way he looks at children. Absolutely. And whatever the case Absolutely. may be. And that's, you know, one of the things that juvenile court has the benefit of doing is not only do we handle cases of children who have gotten charges and delinquent, delinquencies, but we deal a lot of our cases have to do with parenting and teaching parents how to co-parent and raise good children. And so... And that's a struggle. It's, it is a struggle. But you see, the juvenile court is the last stop where the home is broke down and that's where it winds up on and you can go sit outside in y'all's parking lot and watch the crowds come in before in the morning yes and you can say dysfunction 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 Absolutely. dysfunction you know Absolutely. and and people need help they need because help. the families have been destroyed in america and, and the families are not intact and, and the children are raising themselves that's exactly now if we can get the families now this building we're going to have sheila is going to be these are uh, these uh, six rooms here and the audience can't see this but we're going to have six rooms it's the size of a half of a basketball court it's wonderful and we're going to use a master teacher program where we put tables in there and we put a person like you at a microphone and we're going to talk about the family and how we get along with each other in the family and you got families sitting at those tables and we can make a difference in those families' lives because a person like you that's got the expertise of the law right. and expertise of family, right. you can give advice to those families on how to learn to communicate with each other. I think that's a winner. It's a winner. I'm 100% behind you. It's a winner. I think it can, if you bring the muscle of the court with you. Absolutely. Where this is what we expect and this is what will work for you and this will make your home a happy place. Absolutely. One of my observations is Sheila is men with men. Now, okay. I have this issue with men <laughs> letting their homes go to pot. I have an issue with that. I think men need to stand up and fight for their homes and they need to rescue their homes. And you do that in child support. You're yeah. facing that all the time when yeah. you're working in child support. Is men think that when they go in the workplace, they've got to be right. Well, they do. If you work for me and you're not right, I'll fire you. you, right. you got to be right. You're right. But when they go home, the rule changes, the goal changes. You not to be right at home, to be, be happy. happy. That's be right. Happy. Yeah. Be, be happy. happy. <laughs> when you get there, you uh, make your goal being happy. And you know that's hard to do. It is. It is. It I'll is. go home tired, and I'm wanting to do, and then I have to think, ooh, I need to be happy. Because right. if I am not happy at home, then the children are not happy, mama's not happy, the Absolutely. whole thing gets tense. But if I go home and be happy and make the environment happy. If we could teach families in Nashville to absolutely. be happy when they get absolutely. home, child have a safe place and a happy place to grow. That's, that's all right. I have, a, I have to put a shout out. I have a, uh, one of the, my former coworkers, uh, Bob Griffith, that's his, he counsels every man that comes to their courthouse in that court system that he has uh, relations with and says, man, you don't have to be right. You just have to be happy. That's right. But if we he have men awesome. teaching men that lesson, and teaching them how that how important it is, and so we, you know, we have that informally in the court through a court officer, and these are kind of things that we have to do. We have to bottle that and 
think out the box and make that available for everybody. And just so kind what of you're saying is move that out into the community, where it's move a community that center, out to the community. Absolutely. Uh, where a community gets involved with children's yes. lives. If we can get the men of the community, and the men are going to have to, and we've got a lot of men that want to. Right. They just don't they know where to go. They, they, do. they don't. But I think you could make that thing work, and you could get centers all over Nashville. Not just my center, but you can get centers all over Nashville. And that would be the goal. And that fits back into the uh, community school. Yes. You know, the local community yeah. school, because when we built these big schools, everybody thought that was a good idea. I don't think that's really, I think we re rethink that thing. We right. look it back over again. Yeah. But it is, that, I like that plan. I think that's good. I, th I, I think, think it, it's going to work. It's going to help to change our community. It's going to decrease juvenile crime because when you have people who are connected to the family, they hold the family accountable and you don't have to re depend on the court to do it. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to decrease juvenile crime. It's going to decrease all the dysfunction that we see on it on a regular basis. And we can get families, if we can get children wanting to go home be with their family. Absolutely. I missed a conference call this morning just because my family was having such a, and I left my phone, I care of this phone, it's got all <laughs> these bleeps on it. But my family was having such a good time at breakfast this morning, I missed a conference call. Wonderful. Because Wonderful. we was having such a good time. Wonderful. Now that and that's child, good. That's that good. Granddaughter went off to school in good shape. Absolutely. Because we'd had a good time. Now she may get thrown out today, but <laughs> I mean she went in but that's what we're saying. That's what we're saying. And, you know, we talked about this before. If we spend more time focusing on building good positive relationships with our children from the moment they get up to the moment they get on the school bus or get dropped off at the school and make it an early moment. Don't make it a rushed moment. Right. Make it a moment where they can have quality time with their parents or their guardians or whoever it is so that they can have a fresh good day the school system would change completely too and it would improve the courts won't see them the courts won't see it it'll improve learning it will improve retention it will improve so many things if we te we have to teach family leaders we Big have leaders. to have bold leaders You're who can take time. that message Okay. You're out of time. Sorry. Will you come back? I'll come back. I'll come back. I'll finish right where I stopped. Okay, because I tell you what, <laughs> you've got some good ideas. You've given me more information than a lot of people have. You've Thank really you. been helpful in working with youth. You're a leader for youth. What was that? You want to be a leader for youth of Nashville. So. That's exactly right. That's right. Folks, this is Sheila Calloway. We appreciate having her here. She's a friend of inner city. Thanks for tuning in. God bless. Troubles will soon be happy forever more when we meet on that shore free from our care. Rising up, rising up in the sky, telling this world goodbye.